Well, good evening, LCM. Good evening. Tonight is Thursday, March 10th, 2022. Y'all ready for the title of tonight's sermon? Yeah. The title of tonight's sermon is The Red Dragon, Tacos, and a Snake. The Red Dragon, Tacos, and a Snake. And we can assure you this evening that it will not be boring. You may love us in the Lord more by the end of tonight. Some of you may even grow in a distaste for us, but by no means will you be bored on this evening. We want to begin with you where all good things start, and that is right in the Torah, the Genesis of all things. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3, and let's start off in verse 1. So Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the servant, serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now we're 6,000 years or so of human history past this point. And approximately 6,000 sermons on this exact <laughs> verse. That's true. This is not something that you haven't read before. But with all of the background we have, you know the answer to the question. No. This is a subtle twisting of what God actually said. The enemy's tactic here was to take the reality of the kingdom and begin to twist it in their minds. The subtle twisting of God's word has always been the challenge facing us. It's not a modern invention, no matter how much social media wishes to prove that point. It's just a new magnification of it. You're acquainted with this kind of warfare. You know what it is to face a kingdom that is against the kingdom of God, that likes to take the word of God and twist it. Now... Knowing this truth, the number of times that I, I mean, just me personally. Me too. Knowing that the enemy likes to take things that are true, just twist them and offset it a little bit. A shocking number of times I've been driven off of the truth by some of the same questions. Did God really say? Man, if you could see on a billboard the number of thoughts that I've had rolling through my mind about things I know the Lord clearly said. Rattling around in there, that challenging question. Or things like, does his word really apply here in this particular nuanced situation? I know I'm entirely alone in having those thoughts. No, nope, you're not questions. alone at all. Or ones like, aren't we doing okay already? Why do I feel this pressure all of a sudden? See, church, these serpent-like, subtle, and oftentimes not so subtle twisting of scripture... It always ends in great sin. And today we're living in a post-Christian nation, and we are absolutely experiencing the fruit of it in every way. We want you to hear the words of Genesis 3 and verse 15 as it introduces the climate that we're actually a part of. In Genesis 3.15 it says, And I will put enmity, I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. Church, we just want to let you be awake and aware to this tonight, that you are hostile toward the world and toward the prince of this world. Come on. And you're supposed to be encouraged at the promise that's found right here in the third chapter, three whole chapters into the word, that he will crush the head of the serpent. Church, who's the he here? Oh, come on. <laughs> Who is the he who is going to crush the serpent's head, LCM? <laughs> Now that was the right answer. See, you've been adopted into his holy family. You are his sons. Church, you are his ambassadors. By the very fact that you carry the name Christian, it identifies you as a little Christ. See, you are here to crush this garden snake's head. Oh, it's going to make for a really awkward evening if you don't talk to me. <laughs> because I'm not going 45 minutes with no response. Were you made, Eric Stevens, to represent Christ and crush the serpent's head? Yes! Now, is it just Eric Stevens, or were you born again to the same king? We were! Are you an ambassador of God in this house? Yes! Then somebody say the word garden. Garden! Say it one more time. Garden. Garden! Now say snake. Snake! You were made, born, crafted, born from above to destroy a garden snake. One that has been your adversary from the beginning. 
A little bitty garden snake that likes to twist the truth of Scripture. Now that we've clearly squared up our fight, that we're putting into perspective what we are contending with, that the adversary is a little garden snake and you are born again of the one who crushes the serpent's head. Now that you know the final outcome of this battle, we would like to visit the end of the book with you after looking at the announcement of the battle in the first three chapters of Genesis. We're going to Revelation, y'all. We're going to Revelation 12, verse 3. Somebody say there when you're there. There. <laughs> Speaking by faith. Here we go. Prophesy. Revelation 12. Prophesy. Prophesying. Revelation 12 and verse 3 says, Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars right out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment it was born. Now, now I, thought, I thought we said that we were talking about a little itty-bitty garden snake. How did we get from a garden snake to an enormous red dragon? What, what started off as crafty questions did God really say? The primary method of that garden snake was to ask uh, intriguing questions to us. And now we're seeing a dragon whose tail is sweeping the stars, sweeping actual angelic beings out of the sky itself and to the earth. See, we've got heads and horns that are representing power and nations in the world. This dragon is marked by incredible power and dominion. And more than that, did you catch the last part of verse 4? The dragon is standing there waiting, stood, standing in front of the woman so that it might devour her child upon birth. This is in a very intense situation. We were talking about a garden snake and now we're talking about a dragon. How in the world did we get here? You know, in some households, certainly not mine, there's a certain period in the month that is not every male's favorite. Sometimes it's met with great opposition. The beautiful things you felt like you had been building all month can be swept away in just a couple of hours. But what we are talking about today is the areas of satanic opposition that seem to have grabbed dominion, a foothold, power, that don't feel so easy to crush all of the sudden. See, there's a tension between two truths that we're speaking about tonight. There is both a garden snake that we are contending with, that the crushing of his head has been promised in advance. But there is also an enormous red dragon out there that has very real dominion over the earth. That tension between two truths is something that's not just a matter of perception, like, well, it's the glass half full or half empty. You know, if I feel victorious today, it's a snake. No. It is a very real dominion over the earth, and it is also something that is a garden snake that is supposed to be under your heel. You following me with the tension between those two things? Yes. Tonight, we want to throw away the concept of its mind over matter. Oh, brother, if I say it's joyful enough, then it'll cover over what is actually happening in my life and supplant it, replace it, and position you with Christ, the serpent crusher. That you will stand at his right hand and know what it is to actually crush the serpent that we face. Revelation 12 verses 7 through 9 is going to help us out in this. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. Are you hearing that there's real warfare? That there's real tension inside of this fight? But he, the dragon was not strong enough. Amen. And they lost their place in heaven. Saints Jude records Michael interacting with Satan and having a certain measure of trepidation. The Lord rebuke you, he said. Jude goes on to say you shouldn't slander celestial beings and uses Michael as the example. When Michael had to contend with him, did he cease being a great dragon? No. All right, you've got to answer me. Did he cease being a dragon? No. So what is the difference between the garden snake and this dragon? Well, before we answer that question, we want to keep reading to help you. In verse 9, take a look. The great dragon was hurled down. 
that ancient serpent oh, called the on. devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Come on now, church, you have to grasp this, that John the Apostle, the writer of Revelation, he's detailing the great power of this enormous red great dragon. He also hearkens back to Genesis 3. Do you see this, how we're at the end of the story? And he goes all the way back to the original form that we see this enemy in as the ancient serpent. Come on. See, both the archangel Michael and the apostle John had wrestled to be close to the Lord. John was a man that, that the Lord loved. He was close to him. The archangel Michael is obviously close to the Lord. And these two represented God arguably as well as any other, maybe outside of the Messiah himself. You're getting a picture of the angelic realm in Michael. You're getting a picture of an actual man in the apostle John. See, they acknowledged both that their adversary was a great dragon and that their adversary was a ancient garden serpent. See, their position, their closeness to the Lord, where they were actually standing, informed their interactions and what that adversary actually looked like in that moment. Somebody say they were able to clinch. They were able to clinch. They were able to clinch with the reality of the great red dragon and called to mind that he was just a garden serpent. The apostle John who is issuing the ending of the Torah. He's ending the Tanakh. He's bringing about the culmination of all prophecy that ties together what has been given. And he reminds you that that great red dragon that has dominion over the earth is just the ancient serpent from the garden. We want you to consider the Apostle Paul's words regarding your position, your work, your purpose, and the tension between these two truths. Romans 16 verse 20. The God of peace. Somebody tell me what peace is. Shalom. The God of shalom will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. What on earth could Paul be referencing? Perhaps See, he's reaching all the way back to the Genesis account. See, your English teacher was wrong in what you learned. And the great Republic of Texas is absolutely correct. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under y'all's feet. Everybody say y'alls. See, y'all and y'alls. I just used y'alls to make sure that you knew it was plural. Right? The grace of our Lord Jesus be with y'all. This is a plural passage. It is speaking to the group. And additionally, we found a really, really neat and interesting thing that I think you're gonna, it's going to help you to remember and bring this concept home to you. Just so we don't, you know, miss point number two. Wow. Just to ensure we got point number one. Somebody say y'all. Y'all. You is there in the English, but it is not singular in the Greek. So you is one body of Christ, one man before God. The Lord is saying you all or y'all will crush Satan under your feet. Do you understand the collective nature of the body of Christ? It's not an individualic mindset. It is one body, and you form his feet and occasionally his fist. Come on now. Isn't that an awesome revelation that we're beginning to really grasp as a church? So many verses that we read as the singular, it is plural in every kind of way. Now, we found something else that was very interesting. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. As we studied in the New Testament through the LXX, it was indicating that the word was not just a singular, climactic, in times judgment that would come in the future, but instead it was talking about a quickness, a swiftness, a speed at which God would in fact crush the head of the serpent underneath your feet. The word here in the Greek, in its proper enunciation and yes. pronunciation, is tacos. Now that's not Tex Max. That's not Tex Max. It's actually Greek. In the Greek, it is. Tacos. Everybody say that with me. Tacos. Wasn't that fun? Come Tacos. You speak Greek. Congratulations. <laughs> this word that is translated as soon, the God of Shalom will soon crush Satan under your feet. It is about the quickness, the swiftness, 
the speed with which he will do it in addition to the idea that a final outcome is somewhere in the future. This is talking about now. This is talking about how you're going to put your foot on the enemy's head and crush him. We, have a, we take a survey of some of the scriptures throughout the Older Testament and on into the Newer Testament. And we want to show you how this word, tacos, is used throughout the word. Now, in a survey of the word tacos throughout the LXX and into the New Testament, you're going to find out that it has to do with two things. One which we already highlighted. It does mean the culmination of all things. But consistently, it has a much more impactful and present-day kind of context. Amen. Exodus 32.8. Listen. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Interact with me a little bit. This is Moses speaking. Is he talking about uh, Israel's sin someday out in the future? No. Is this I or is this here, right now? How quick you have been to turn away. Isaiah 5 verse 19 is also not such a good situation. It says, to those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so that we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach, let it come into view so we may know it. We have always been in days where men mock the coming of the Lord as if it is not coming. They want to see something. Well, the word tacos here is hurry and hasten in this passage. These are men who are saying, yeah, we believe the Lord will come in a sarcastic attitude. And they're saying, we want to tacos it. I want to see it swiftly, now, immediately in front of me. The word itself carries a connotation of something that is demonstrated before men's eyes to see within their lifetime. Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. As this is a messianic psalm that we don't have time to go through. But this is at the point where Messiah, Jesus, has returned and he is sitting on his holy hill. And the nations are being told, he's here now. There's no more waiting. Tacos, his anger can be kindled in a moment. Again, it is communicating the idea that something climactic is going to change right now. First Chronicles 12, 8 is one of my favorites. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the wilderness. They were brave warriors, ready for battle, and able to handle the shield and spear. Their faces were the faces of lions, and they were as uh, quick as the coming of the Lord on a calendar or hundred-year kind of level. No, they were swift. This word here in this passage implies that the weapons that they currently possessed and carried as they rallied to David were quick and effective in their use. The connotation is swiftness as in an action. It had a result when they showed up. They weren't slow on a calendar like I expect to see them arrive at the battle scene sometime at the end of the ages. When David said they were swift, he meant they were fast in the heat of battle. They were quick when pressed. They were ready to fight. Luke 18.8 gives us one more perspective on this word. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. This is about God who is a just judge and our relationship to him. By way of contrast, we've used the judges of the world. But in regard to the judge of all the earth, when he has decided to bring down judgment, when his justice has come to the point where he is rendering his decision, oh my God, is it sudden? It is overwhelming. It's like a flood the moment that it happens. This, once again, is tacos. It is the moment... That judgment is no longer pending, but now is swift and occurring. Saints, this is what our lives produce. This is what it means to be a friend of the serpent crusher. He is crushing and he is filled with power. But it is coming swiftly, immediately crushing Satan under your feet. And actions. Well, then let us help you by going back to Romans 16 and verse 20, taking what you just heard Pastor tell you about, and let's put this into the verse now. The God of shalom, the God of peace, will immediately, swiftly, currently, within the heat of battle, crush Satan underneath your 
are y'all's feet. This is what God is doing and what he is bringing here into this place. This concept of tacos, that it will be immediate. It's swift. It is currently happening right now. That's the attitude that we are to act with. That is the power that we must walk in. Now, to help you get this a little bit more, because we all need a little help to get it, especially when it's something that we're not used to seeing. We got a, a, little, a little video an educational video on what tacos is all about. That's a cobra. Fat on, fat on, fat on, fat on, Get him, tacos. Get him. <laughs> In the face. Cap on me. No cap, eh? Skip him. Skip him. Nice. It's my. It's my cap on me. That's a bad thing. Cap on me. Yeah, no, she's like. All right. Come on, give it up for tacos. Come on now. Did you guys see how tense the beginning of the video was? Did you guys catch that that was an actual cobra, like a hooded cobra snake? Just a garden snake. Did you notice how tacos began to rise within the dog and so did the master's joy? <laughs> the cobra tried to tower. It stood there trying to look imposing, like a dragon maybe. But because of his position in tacos, he was reduced to a simple little garden snake. Come on now, church. Did you notice how you got more and more joyful as this went on? Amen. At first it attacked and it started to wrangle with it. And then you were like, yes, victory! And then you realize the snake wasn't completely dead. So go after him again. Go get him again. Until he quit moving. And then you felt it. You heard it on the video, but you felt it in this room of that little dog that we're going to call Tacos. Demonstrating some tacos with that garden snake. Pastor just mentioned that tension you felt. Is anybody in the room concerned from the, for the dog when it started? I mean, immediately. I'm worried he's going to get bit. Like, this, this video is about to go bad. I know why everybody's watching it. Our society is morbid. <laughs> Fail video. <laughs> but then the overwhelming sudden joy when the dog overcomes his fear in that moment and he launches. Yeah. Something swift causes him to be consumed with joy. Yeah. Saints, this is what tacos is. And it brought such joy to his master to see him overcome and do what he was born to do. Hey, who was videoing that? Do you mean there was a situation in which he was expecting his dog to be victorious in this? Okay, just checking. So whether the dog knew in the moment or not that it would be victorious, it overcame and something swift came out of it. So if the master is videoing this, what does he already know? He knows what he's put inside of his servant. Guys, we want to talk to you a little bit tonight about something interesting. Are you ready? Anybody in the room like Tex-Mex? We want to talk to you tonight about Tacos Tuesday. Yeah. We're talking about the kind of Taco Tuesday that leaves you well and right with the world, able to function and get out of the uh, house on the way to work in the morning. 
the kind of tacos that begins to rise inside of you when you obey the master's orders. When you learn what it is to bring the tacos and get beyond your fear. Come on, I'm bringing tacos next Tuesday. I got it. Saints, what we have to wrestle with this evening is that we have a choice as to who's bringing the tacos. Is it the dragon that is bringing the swift, immediate, crushing power into the heat of battle on you? Are you taking your position and your stand with the skull-crushing God named Jesus Christ? Say, we have the ability to stand by our master, who is the one who orchestrated the fight, is watching the fight and taking pleasure in it because he knows that you can win when you stand with him. <laughs> Come on now, how about in our lives? What does this mean for us tonight? Is it a garden snake in your own life? Being currently, swiftly, as in the heat of battle, crushed under your feet when you see difficulties that arise? Or does it feel more like a massive dragon that's poised to devour you? See, the way that you can tell the difference between these two is not just some uh, projection of what you're trying to feel, of what you want it to be. It's how much tacos that you can bring to this fight. That when you step forward, it becomes like a garden snake in your life and you are able to put your heel on its head Come on. every single time. This is the kind of attitude that we have to be, that we have to demonstrate. Is it tacos that's swiftly crushing the garden snake under the feet of your life or is your life being uh, tacoed? In the face. I'm going to show tacos. Because we don't want, what does it look like to be tacos? Is you're filled and dominated by the powerful dominion of a satanic influence in the areas that you are afraid to swiftly, boldly step forward in and watch his power reign in your life. Church, is it a garden snake or is it a great dragon in your life? The status of your own thoughts, your own actions, and your own home are going to show how much tacos that you're bringing to this fight. That's true. So if you walked in here getting tacoed, by the end of this evening, we are going to learn how to bring tacos. Saints, the central issue, the main part of this discussion, is currently going on in our lives right now as long as we've been in church. As many times as we have heard Genesis chapter 3, is that we don't understand a critical aspect of what it says and the God who authored it. So we're going to read Genesis 3, 15 together again. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. From the very beginning, the first three chapters... Saints, the expectation has always been that you would be bitten to win. Saints, there is no crushing the serpent's head without facing the bite and taking it. See, what happened when that dog began to apply tacos? It determined that if it got bit, it was still landing the blow. See, the snake had every opportunity, but he gave up on his fear and decided to live in his purpose. Saints, this is the central difference between swift victory and having a red dragon devour you in every area of your life. Saints, did you know, do you understand the plans of God? God his plans include a crucified son so that victory might result. How much more those of us who have been adopted into his family? He announced it in Genesis 3 that his plans would include us crushing the serpent's head but that you would be bitten to bring about that process. Hey, they include the serpent having the power to harm you, having the power to afflict you, but the ultimate outcome being that he, as in the Messiah, the perfect son of man filled with the spirit of God, would ultimately cause the downfall of that serpent that delivered the bite. Church, this is akin to us understanding this. It's like a boxer who would be entering into a boxing ring expecting never to be punched, never to receive a strike against him, never to actually have to get in the battle, wanting a victory that cost him nothing, a victory that was void of actual battle. How in that world is that possible? 
How can you expect the victorious, our dog Tacos, to be victorious? You know what it felt like because you saw that the struggle was real. The potential for harm was there. See, it's been forgotten in our day and time. In our day of Xbox controller kind of warfare. We're going to expect to hopefully just have a drone kind of warfare. I'm going to sit in a safe trailer in Nevada somewhere and drop bombs on the enemy some, somehow. See, our nation's young males have been on a rigorous training program for just such type warfare. See, but there's always a cost to victory, church. As a people, as a nation, as a culture, the problem is, is that we've lost the taste for having to pay the price. We want a painless kind of battle. Yeah. We want a priceless war, one that doesn't cost us anything. We want warriors who are actually scarless, pristine. We want a biteless victory. See, we want the perspective of being victorious without actually having to pay the bite to be positioned in the position for victory. Thanks. The reality of this has overreaching influence on the way that we think. We are looking for the maximum reward and the minimum investment. Everything about our culture preaches that same message. And the reality is the church culture all around us preaches that message. But you are cut of a different kind of cloth. You are made to be those who pay the full price. And that power does exist within you. You were made to follow the skull-crushing God, Yahweh. But we have to come to sober assessment. When we're watching that little video, the thing that makes your heart flutter, the first few seconds before you see him act, and that defines so much of our daily lives. What does your faith demonstrate? Are you teetering around the things that you know should be accomplished? Working to ignore the snake as if it's not there. Right. Waiting for it to grow up into a great dragon that cannot be taken. Have we so decided that being bitten is no longer worth the cost of victory that there are areas of our own lives that are just untouched, that we don't have the tacos to get it done. What we want to talk to you tonight about is what it takes to win the war we are currently in. The faith that God is calling out of every man, woman, and child in this house. Not the cost that we've paid in eons past. There's no one in here who hasn't given up family or a house to be here. We are talking about the great endeavors of sacrifice that our Christ is calling us to ahead for what must be accomplished. Church, what we need is revival in our own condition. A rending of the heart before God that is a cry for ongoing transformation if we're able to bring victory and see it in our lives and for the rest of the world. We want to we put this slide on the screen for you. This is from Charles Finney, and this was said during a cholera outbreak that was facing his nation. Revival comes from heaven when heroic souls enter the conflict determined to win or die, or if need be, to win and die. Amen. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Church, there has to be a reckoning within us to develop this kind of attitude so that we are not constantly trying to get around the bite, but we're looking to take that on so that we can strike a blow of victory. Let me talk to you about what this looks like in my life. The own, my own actual rebellion towards true correction. Let me say that another way. I have hated the sting. I have hated the bite of actual correction in my life. Never once considering what it was doing to the Lord as I was standing in opposition to him. And in the process of being afraid of that bite, I was never able to position myself for victory. Not swiftly, not decisively, not immediately. You know what? That cause was lingering, unending, continuous battles with really no hope for change. So I had to change my own vocabulary. I had to change my perspective because I wasn't in the position to win against the enemy. All because I was avoiding the bite, the sting of what the correction did in my life. In this past week, I've been wrestling with a deep-seated cowardice, a desire to shrink back rather than summoning tacos 
to deal with hornets that God is bringing into my land to prove, to show, to cause enemies to come to the surface. See, we're in a day and an age where our king is stirring up things that have been there for 5, 10, 15 years because he wants to put them to death. But my own cowardice and fear towards being disqualified sometimes causes me to hide those enemies. Oh, there's nothing really to see here. I've been doing fine for five years up to this point. Why all of a sudden do I feel like I have been regressing? See, what must be done is summoning the tacos to not circle around, to not wait, to not pretend that it doesn't happen, but fully address and confront the enemies that are facing our day. Starting with me in my own home, that we are not afraid to be who we are in Christ and asking God to transform our condition. In this past week, I've had to come to grips with how long I've been unwilling to be bitten with the reality of my current state. I mean, don't mess with my prideful perspective because I want to keep feeling the way that I want to feel. Too faithless to reflect honestly about my own state, my own position, so I could actually stand up and deliver a right hook of victory. See, I chose rather to foster, to nurse, to facilitate my own feelings of inadequacy. The own echoes inside of me. Instead of believing what God has said and trusting in his power to transform, I was losing the battle because I was afraid to be bitten. Anybody ever dealt with disappointment before? Doesn't disappointment sound like a fairly common thing? Something a bit benign? Disappointment has stricken me several times this last week. Feelings of this is not exactly what I thought it would look like. Feelings of having hoped for a better outcome or a different one. They were all too easy to give sympathy to because it felt just like a mild, cute thing that needed to be encouraged. What I want to tell you is that there has been an awakening in my own life. That to be disappointed with anything that God has brought us to is actually to be in opposition to what he desires. It's actually a sweet little fig leaf on top of contempt for his name. In fact, it's a refusal to bring him glory in my own life. You know, Psalm 4 speaks about offering the right sacrifices. It's the latter half that I wrestle with, where it says that we rejoice in them and essentially we refuse to regret right sacrifices. But I'm learning to summon the tacos to deal with it immediately. Instead of pretending it's cute or it's funny as if somehow it's acceptable because it wasn't as vulgar. Instead, treating it as if it is the snake that is in my own garden. Treating it with the hostility that it deserves. Summoning the tacos to swiftly deal with it and ask the God of all creation to help me put my boot on it. In the last week, in the last 10 days in my own home had to come to grips with not wanting to be bitten in my own marriage. That my leading of my own wife transformed a garden snake into an enormous red dragon of pride and rebellion. Much easier for me to go about and actually accuse God of wrong so that I could keep feeling, thinking, and leading the way that I have been. My wife is supposed to be a reflection of me. And what I found out was there were things that were being magnified that I never intended to, but they were because of my lack of ability to be bitten with reality so that I could win. I'm not supposed to be the one that caused it, but I am the cure in my own home. Amen. I am the one who can take on that bite and begin to be victorious because I transform it from the red dragon back into a garden stake and put my heel on the head of the enemy. One last one. Anybody experienced godly vision? Felt like he gave you a prophetic insight for your life or for the lives of others? Yeah, I've been recognizing the degree to which I've seen things that are right, that are genuine, prophetic insight. And then somehow, in that great gift from God, adopted the faithlessness to believe that suddenly it's now my job to make it happen as he showed me. You know, it's an extraordinary thing. I have a God who's kind enough to share things with me, but then I take the gifts that he gives me and I turn it into fear and woe is me. 
Look, we are serving a God who desires to show us his plan for the future. If we are to know his plans for the future, we have to be able to wrestle with the things that are out of order now and trust him with right action, the tacos to do it now, following him, Amen. trusting him in the final outcome of the matter. Amen. Saints, the reality is the areas that we are unwilling to be bidden, unwilling to come to truth and face the facts, to face the cost of victory, they don't stop the loss. It doesn't stop the fact that your home is out of order. It doesn't stop the fact that I'm being faithless. It just denies you the victory. Come on now. We need to wrestle with this. We need to learn what it is to accept the fact that we must be bitten to win. When we do that, a garden snake becomes something that is crushed beneath our feet. But ignoring a garden snake causes it to become a great dragon just by tolerating its existence. More and more dominion and power given through tacit approval. Look, facing the cost, facing the cost of victory is what will swiftly, immediately, forcefully, in the heat of battle, put Satan under your feet. Church, consider Moses and the bronze serpent in Numbers 21. You have to be willing to be bitten. The story goes there in Numbers 21. The truthful portrayal is that they were getting bitten by snakes. See, church, what we see in that is that you have to be willing to turn into that bite and look at the cause, look at the serpent that is there to be able to position yourself to have the victorious power of God come to the rescue. And that in a quick, immediate, current kind of fashion for the battles that you're facing. You have to be able to turn into that bite and ask God to help you and transform you and save you again and again and again. Because facing the bite on the way to victory is what turns a great dragon into a garden serpent. Amen. Like a mere drunk that's going to get bounced out of God's dominion and out of the yep. kingdom. See, this is what is working here in our hearts tonight. Thanks. Anybody in the room began to pray more, be a little more desperate for God when you had children? Yeah. See, the reality is the more responsibility that is given the more reverence and reverential cries come out of us. See, we think that if we just put in charge of things, it will make life easier. That if we could just organize it the way that we wanted it to be, all would be swell. The reality is the closer you get to the Lord and the more of his plan he gives you. And I believe that God is sharing his plan with this body for the nations. You can hear it in any given worship service. It causes us to cry out for the one who is able to make us stand under that load. We need every man in this room to begin to cry out for transformation on a daily basis. We're not talking about an experience a long time ago. We're asking him to transform you for the man that you must be tomorrow for your home, tomorrow for the call of God. In Hebrews 5 verse 7, it speaks of Jesus saying, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Saints, how would your desire for victory be described? Does it look like agonizing prayer, petitions, and fervent cries over the growth of your own life, over the growth of your children, over the growth of your own home? Or does it look like something you've just accepted as a given? Well, if I take them to church, if we read and pray a little bit before bed, they'll turn out okay. Or is it a reverence, desperate cry because you understand the weight of what your father has put on you? There are too many areas that we've accepted that the dragon will always be great. Primarily in our own homes, and it's what God is highlighting in this season because it is necessary for us to enter into the narrow door. I don't know if someone told you there was one narrow door, but there are many, and he's bringing us to yet another. We have accepted areas that we believe are just too big to move. What was supposed to be a garden snake in your life that you're putting underfoot, you've decided it has the power of the kingdom and dominion. This passage is going to help us learn to turn on it. 
verse 8 goes on to say, Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was des designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. See, this agonizing over the cost, the rising determination to win and die in the process if needed had produced the best of the things, son though he was. It has produced a desperate cry in us yes. to the one who can save and crush the serpent's head in my life. This is what it's producing, and this is what it must produce in all of us. The most difficult thing has been to face the responsibility, the culpability that I have for the actions of those around me. The actions of whom, by the way, I cannot control or create the same revelation in. See, the, rev the realization of the years of poor fruit that I personally have sown and the unflinching tacos it will require for me to uproot it. These are the revelations that we are walking in, that I am walking in. It's going to take tacos to yeah. face the bite. But the great dragon will fall like a garden snake every time that we do. Saints, in us, in our own personal weeks, it is producing a rising cry. One that is not, Lord, help me do this better. That is, Lord, transform me, you who have the power to save. I'm beginning to get the idea that my level of holiness in the past was woefully short. But I have no idea how to bring that revelation into the people that I'm responsible for. Lord, I can't do it, and I certainly can't transform myself, much less them. I need you. See, we need a desperation for God to rise. One that says, whatever it takes to obtain his favor. If need be, I will win and die to see his will fulfilled. This is worth it, because my king is worth it. Thanks, when we do this, when we have that kind of attitude, the red dragon that has been in your life. The red dragon that has dominated so many areas. It will be turned into the garden snake that can be conquered with a little tacos. Saints, we are talking about your time. We're talking about what you choose to do on a given evening. The way that you schedule. In the Stevens household, we are evaluating every evening based upon the revelation that we need in our own home. Growing with one another. Growing in holiness with the Lord. And we figure the rest of the world can wait a little while for us to be right with God. In every area, including finances, we must develop a kind of tacos intention. That we no longer deliberate what will happen if we spend this much. What will happen if we go this direction. What will happen if we stretch our thoughts thin. Instead, we decide to stop circling the problem, but show Tacos to swiftly get in it. Church, we're going to take a look at Isaiah 26. And we're going to help us. It's going to help us to understand to be a people called to have their feet on the serpent's head. Look at Isaiah 26 and verse 1. It says, in that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and its ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous may enter, that the nation that keeps faith. Saints, this is who you are, a joyful and a strong city, and the righteous enter, one that is fought against but upon whom the gates of hell cannot prevail. There may be a dragon currently in control of the nations, but within the city God has built a city with salvation as its walls. The adversary is just a garden snake, a serpent quickly, immediately being crushed underfoot. We can take his bites because we are in the citadel of our great God. Are you in the citadel of God? Did you notice the plural form again? We have a strong city. Somebody say, we have a strong city. We have a strong city. The reality is that God always presents these kind of situations where there is an adversary, but he makes walls of salvation. He makes ramparts that protect his people when we stand together. There is no, I have a strong city. Thanks. Rather than beating on you, we want to encourage you. We want to remind you. There is no, I have a strong city, 
but we in this house have a strong city. It is a wrong and a wicked thought to think that we are strong on our own. The only way to crush the serpent that is attacking our lives, to be able to defend against and endure the bites of the enemy, is to learn to stand together, is to learn to help one another have the tacos to get it right. You, as an individual, do not have a strong city. You do not have a strong city outside of your brothers. The God of peace or shalom, right order with God and man, will swiftly crush Satan under y'all's feet, not your feet. There's a mentality shift that needs to go, one that is an army of God, not individuals. And you've heard it said in this congregation for years, you cannot serve God anywhere but only where he has placed you. Anybody in this house heard that? Yeah. Let's make it clear. You cannot serve God with anyone, but only those he has positioned you with. Or perhaps be even a little more direct, men. You cannot serve God without your wife. Come on. Your primary ministry to the Lord is to minister to her well, and it is the foundation of not your city, our city. Amen. Let's say that again. Let's say that again. You cannot have a strong city, husbands, without being unified in vision, in heart, and in fervent commitment with your wife. Now that means, understand what I'm saying here, that your fervency, husband, has to be demonstrated, has to be replicated inside of your wife, or you are not yet building the strong city that God is talking about. Your love for the word should be mimicked, should be replicated, should be, should be a reflection that is seen in your wife. That is the kind of fervent commitment that must be there. It's not enough that you're thinking just about yourself and you going, let me get away and be quiet with the Lord. Let me go off away from my family to study because that seems pious. You have to develop cultivate, create inside of your own home the same fervency that with which you are operating before the Lord. Wow. That's what it looks like to build a strong city. The truth is, is no matter how called you think that you are or how long you have uh, loved the Lord, you're, which is usually a lie because that means you've been actually avoiding the fight altogether. To keep a high opinion of yourself, you haven't been getting bit and you haven't been being victorious. You end up being under the dominion of the great dragon until you learn to position yourself in unity and stop lying about your own perspective of how well you're doing. Don't be fooled, church. Don't be fooled, husbands. Compliance and shalom, not the same thing. Compliance and shalom are not the same thing. Not in your life, not in the life of your family, not anywhere, not ever. See, refusal to bring glory to the king in your wife's actions, husbands, or in her demeanor is a direct reflection of your own heart's condition and the dominion of the great dragon. Pastor, that feels a bit harsh. I can't control what she does. I can't control why this happened. I'm trying to pastor it. See, it wouldn't exist if you had taken the brunt of the bite to deal with it and gain victory. The reason that that vicious moment still exists is because you shied away from the bite. It's a reflection of our own hearts. Saints, if you fail to bring genuine shalom and commit to win and die into your home, saints, you're useless in every other area. You're useless until you learn to do it with your wife. There's a reason it's the basic qualification for ministry. It's that you lead your home well and we'll see what happens after that. But it's the foundation and the place that we start. And you cannot build onto any other area until you do it. Decades in the faith. Do not change this reality. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the faith or how fervent you personally are. Until we learn to do this, we cannot rise higher. So true. Our great king has set this congregation on a crushing conquest. He's lined us out. And he, our good king, will be victorious. But saints, the question remains of our own participation in that campaign. Because we cannot do it without building the foundation right. 
to accomplish what is ahead, we must build stronger teams that are equipped to fight in tandem. But the brass tacks, the truth of the matter, is that our practice in our own marriages must rise to be able to build anything else. We cannot build teams unless we build marriages. Right. Praise God, teams have a way of highlighting cracks in the foundation, though, so you can go back and fix them. Mark our words, church. The test has not yet begun. The bite to come must be gloried in because we dwell in a secure city and know that Yahweh's crushing victory is coming. It is imminent for us. If you can't endure the biting reality required to get your own home in lasting shalom, you have no place in the conquest ahead. This goes for every man and woman in this room. If you are not able to produce lasting shalom in your own home, you'll have no place in the conquest ahead. We might as well just leave you back with the, uh, the women and the Baptists there. I believe that we are honestly coming to grips and we will have to increasingly in the days ahead. With the great dragon-like areas that we've been unwilling to pay the cost, take the hit, lose the men that is required to see real victory. Because if we're going to see the things we believe our Lord is telling us about, it's going to come at a great cost. The delusion, the false perspective of being further along than you actually are, trying to present that to the world and convince yourself must die yeah. and give way to an actual position of victory because you are paying all cost. Not that you're unscathed, but you're paying the cost to win. The hiding behind your inability to change your spouse's heart must die. Saints, it's time to rise in the authority that you already have. The authority to crush the serpent starting in your life and in your home before anywhere else. Church, this message must produce in you a desperate cry for the one who can save you or it's all for naught. See, together, when we rise to stand with the God of all shalom, the God of all right order, he will crush our adversaries under our feet. We have and are building a strong city and only the righteous nation will be allowed to enter. Righteousness is, in fact, defined by our right order with the God who arranges all things. Not the mere Amen. perspective that we are trying to present, but the actual position that we stand in. See, when we're with him, the garden snake will fall. Come on. But if we are not, our households, our teams, then the dragons begin to devour. The Apostle Peter's word comes back to mind in another description of this enemy, that he is like a roaring lion, searching for someone to devour. Now, whether that's an actual lion or a pussycat inside the home completely depends on who brought the tacos to this party. Think about that for a moment. Is it like a lion if it's devoured you? No, it's very much so a lion in your life. It is like a lion when you know what it is to bring the tacos and resistance. This is, I'm willing to get a scratch or a bite, but I'm driving you out. Peter actually says he will flee when we come with the tacos. But if he is bringing the tacos to us because we're trying to protect our self-image, then we are asking to be devoured. Look, there is great news tonight. It's great news that our good king has called, chosen, and selected every one of you to be able to stand with him. He has anointed you to be positioned with him as that great skull-crushing Messiah that will put an end to the serpent. Isaiah 8, 18 says this, Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. Notice once again, it's not here am I, great preacher. It is here am I and the family that you have given me. We are signs. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. Amen. To the law and to the testimony. Amen. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Saints, in this house, we are done with dead words. 
We are done consulting the worldly church. We are done consulting worldly relatives. We are done with old habits that have produced nothing but death in our homes. Today we are going to the law and the testimony. Amen. We are going to take our stand, our position as families in one greater family as the sign that God is coming to crush the enemy's head. When we choose to take our stand like this, when we determine that even if it cost us our life, we will not yield, something begins to happen. In 2 Timothy 2, in our final few minutes together, we want to read to you beginning in verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in that grace, that power over sin. Church, be strong in the tacos that God is giving to us. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. See, this is exactly why we've been sharing to you from our own struggles, our own issues, what the Lord is doing inside of us. Because you have to be able to start by teaching your home to crush the serpent. You have to teach your home to have fervent commitment to the desire of the Lord. To have that same desire throughout your entire family that is to Christ. As a home that is determined to win and die as often as is needed. Look at what verse 3 goes on to say. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Church, I don't know how many ways we can say it, but tonight you have to get this. You have to be willing to be bitten to win. We have to be willing to be bitten to win and to deliver the knockout blow. Because no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding Come officer. On. It's time to cut through the fear that has made the garden snake in your own life like an enormous red dragon. It's time to have the tacos to step up and to deal with it. To take the bite, but to deliver the knockout blow. Similarly, verse 5, if anyone competes as an athlete. He does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. You know what the rules are? You got to start in your home. You know what the rules are? You have to be able to build it from that home into teams that we can actually build an entire strong city together. Look at verse 6. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Church, the benefit, the blessing, the good news is that you're the first to share in the fruit if you're the one bringing the Tacos Tuesday to the house. Come on, somebody say there's fruit in store. There's fruit in store. For us. For us. Thanks. When you're able to grasp this, when you know what it is to be strong in his grace, his power over sin, when you recognize that you are reliable men, which is why we are preaching to you, and that God is qualifying you to teach others, when you learn what it is to endure hardship, not only be willing, but face the biting because you know it will bring about victory. Amen. Saints, this is the making of men who do not deviate when it's hard to work in a team. This is the making of men who do not deviate when it's hard to preach the gospel. But it is also the making of men who will be the first to reap the harvest that our king is bringing about. Amen. Verse 7 goes on to say, reflect on what uh, we are saying this evening. For the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Saints, there is a heart rending that is needed. We need to cry out to the mighty king who is able to give us insight into the areas that we have been unable to overcome the dragon. Instead, we've decided to ignore it while it grows. But they would also give us a revelation into his skull-crushing power for those who believe. You, your wife, your children... Your brothers on your left and right in this one citadel do not have to suffer under his influence any longer. You can put that garden snake to death tonight. We wanted to return to Isaiah 26 with you. Verse 1 says, In that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. The nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect shalom 
Those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. We serve a God who is able to make you stand steadfast. A God who is able to cause you to be in shalom, right order. To position you with him and his great victory. This is an evening for you to rise in your inner man to right sacrifices. Not to the minimum. Not to what will be acceptable on your left and right. Don't embarrass me, baby. Don't embarrass me. Don't let me be put to shame. No, a heart that says, I want to sacrifice all for holiness or die trying. To rise to right action and unyielding purpose. To put that serpent beneath your feet for you and those coming after you. Our minds must be steadfast if we are to complete this journey. Our trust must be steadfast if we are to make it to the end. And the angel's words to Elijah come back to mind. Sometimes we have to get up and eat and drink so that we can be sustained long enough to reach the goal. We can no longer be afraid to be bitten. But rather bring the tacos to the fight by volunteering the bite. He says, I'm more than happy to take it. Right here, go for it. Here is my arm because the other arm is going to deliver knockout changing power over sin. No more allowing garden snakes to become and grow up into dragons. We're going to kill the ones that you do have together because we have a strong city and we're going to do it through transparency, boldness, and a commitment with one another. But I'm intent in my own soil. And my little clan is a part of this larger body. Not to allow garden snakes to become great dragons any longer under my watch. I don't know about you, but I'm done wavering in steadfastness. I'm done wavering in a shalom and right order that brings crushing power. I want to live in it. I want to live in a city that knows what it is to have God as its walls. We're no longer waiting to be struck by the enemy. We are now volunteering whatever it takes. Whatever sacrifice has to be paid in every family here. If it's a change in your job to pastor your home well, great. If it is a commitment to actually be faithful in your job no matter what it costs you, great. But no more shrinking back from the sacrifices that he's calling in this room. We wasted too much time in so many areas. As we grow in our awareness, how many things can you look back and see? Man, I wish I knew that 10 years ago. I believe that our God will give us a revelation of what we need to know 10 years from now. And that he will give the men of this congregation the strength to put it underfoot. And men like Carlos Reda will help others do the same. Amen. The men like Jaron are going to stand up and be able to prophesy out of the depths of their soul because they've been close to the Almighty God. That we are raising up a harvest here. That are not those who will shrink back. But those who will give of themselves. And not just the men. But families that are ready to die for the cross of Christ. I'm about to ask you to stand. But man, I'm asking you to take a moment to steal your resolve. I want you to cry out. I want you to pray. But I want you to do it for your own homes in the night, in the mornings. I want it to be the life that you live. Pastor and I are sharing with you what's going on in our own hearts. Because God is expecting more of us. And it's not fixed just by weeping at an altar. It is fixed by determining your soul that I will be steadfast in God until my family gets where he's called us. And I'm not leaving my brothers on my left or right behind. There is a resolve that is born of the spirit that we need in this moment. That is what we are to ask him for together. And as we worship, we are singing praises to the God who is able to save us all together. Stand to your feet. Mighty one, we thank you for the households that are here. Lord, we believe that you have divinely ordained each one of them. Lord, we're asking that you might give us a new revelation of who you are. Lord, that the serpent in his twisting would find no ground among us any longer. Lord, that we learn to stand with you and put our feet on the neck of the enemy. Almighty God, that victory would be the result of this night. That tonight men might rise in greater levels of leadership. 
Lord, that women might be supernaturally empowered to propel their families towards the right action that has been given. Lord, we spread ourselves out before you and say, arrange your city as you have determined, almighty God. 